Chapter 2 Un Homme de Petit The rules at last agreed, Paul Mink promised to tell them more after they reached the freeze and were off on the raft. Then the three of them settled down to an easy companionship, playing a hand or two of old flat and a simulated folded paper version of Henri's special turbulence, which could only be modified with difficulty and which they eventually abandoned by mutual consent, having failed to discover mutually communicable harmonics. One evening, as Captain Ornate pumped his melancholy squeeze box in a corner and a couple of whiteys capered to the old familiar Z tunes, the conversation turned to the subject of animals and whether it was possible to have significant conversations with them. Mrs. Von Beck spoke of the famous Englishman, Squire Begg, a cousin of hers, and his affinity with crows. He believed they possessed a primitive wisdom enabling them to talk in some way with humans, but first one had to learn and obey their language and customs, which were simple enough, though immutable. It was by these customs that down long millennia crows survived. Assured of your courtesy, the crow would give you full attention to your thoughts and desires. Crows, she said, came from all over the world to his London mansion in Sporting Club Square, and he was frequently sketched in the company of Egyptian, Amazonian or Antipodean crows mostly hooded, who would mysteriously leave, returning without warning to their native grounds. I was once an initiate of my tribe's crow cult. Rodrigo heats words with thick as Mississippi mud. My totem was the crow. I was sworn to protect the crow and all his kind, even with my life, even above my family. In return, the crow offered us his wisdom, but this advice was not always suited to modern times. I heard of a young buckaree up in Arizona who had his eyes pecked out by a crow. He went crazy in the sun, they said, and jumped off that old London bridge up there, straight down until he hit the granite thinking he was a crow, said Sister Honesty Marvel. Nobody ever found out why. Sam Oakenhurst suggested a game of Mad John Parker, but Honesty Marvell favoured Doc Granite. So in the end they made it a tambourine game and shouted like kiddikins over it. That night the Rose told Sam Oakenhurst that they might have to kill Paul Minked. At your service, he signalled, but bile came up in his throat. We are not fragments of the whole, the Rose would insist but versions of the whole. Mr. Oakenhurst had told her of the last time he had stood in a ploughed field full of bright pools of winter rain on the fine, pale blue evening, with the great orange sun bleeding down into the horizon, and watched a big dog fox brush high as he picked his way amongst the furrows, circling the meadow where he was hidden by the lattice of the hedge, sniffing the wind for the geese who had begun to honk with anxious inquiry. All of it had disappeared, Mr. Oakenhurst said, in the Hattiesburg roar. I had thought that at least must endure. Now even our memories are becoming suspect. He had no qualms about killing the man if he proved actively dangerous to them, but he was not at all sure he could play this. He had given his word to something for which he might not possess the necessary bottom. By now, he was as nervous of losing her approval as he was terrified by Paul Minkth's displeasure. The irony of this amused and sustained him. Ma romance, she sang. Nouvelle romance, ma romancier. Moi necromancier. Jolie boy old danse, jolie boys old danse. But they shall not have... Moi colère. Chapter 3. El bueno, el feo y el malo. The three left the whole hog when she ran aground on a mud bank near Poker Flats. But not before Sister Honesty Marvell had butchered Roy Ornate in a quarrel over the nature of things. Paul Minked had finished her with a glass spike whereupon the swamp people, some devolved survivalists, had 
tried to crawl aboard to be repulsed and mostly blown apart by the violent anti-gravity reaction of the colour to their metal. They were extinguished by the power of their ornaments. Carly O'Dowd was dead too from a poison she had picked up somewhere, and there was reasonable fear of a whitey uprising until Rodrigo Heat put himself in charge. Almost as soon as they were ashore, they came upon a scattering of the swamp people's weapons, flung this far into the reed beds by the colour. Sam Oakenhurst had never held an original Olivetti PP6 before, and he treasured the instrument in his hands, to the Rose's open amusement. Take up one of these weapons for yourself, ma'am, Paul Minx became proprietorial, motioning with his wicked fingers. It'll almost certainly prove useful to you. He bent and his arms, encased in hide, again emerged from their velvet wrappings to examine the scattered hardware. I've made this journey before. Many times this journey. Yes, this time we will go on. He straightened, turning the glittering weapon in her direction and, gasping at sudden pain, examined his pricked wrist. He watched the wand that had wounded him disappearing back into her cloak at the same moment as she apologised. She is sometimes hasty in my defence. Swift thorn, he said. The wind was ugly in their ears, a grey wine from the north. You would not prefer to pack this OK-9, continued Paul Minked, some kind of backup. He dangled the thing by its flared snout, as if tempting a whitey gal to a piece of pie. But she had stirred a memory in him, and he turned away, looking out to where the saplings shivered. To Sam Oakenhurst, she flashed a fresh play. Then she gathered her gravitas, so that when, also controlled, Mr Minked turned back, she seemed proudly insouciant of any slight. Again Sam Oakenhurst recognised a game beyond his usual experience. She is all I shall need, said the Rose, almost distantly, while Paul Minked retreated, having apologised with equal formality. He took the OK-9 for himself, and also had a Ryman's 3280, a beastly primitive weapon, in his pack. They were walking up a well-marked old road which followed the edge of the lake. The road had run between Shreveport and Houston once. They could follow it, Paul Mink assured them, as far as San Augustine. I have heard or read of a weapon called Swift Thorn, he added as he lengthened his gait to lead them south, the subject of some epic. Not the subject, she said. Oh, he is easily clever enough to kill me, Sam. He tricked me into a show. He doesn't know that he succeeded. He will not dare risk a move on you until he's sure of me. Sam Oakenhurst fell in beside her. I must take risks, Sam. He must not escape me. I am pledged to his destruction. Hey, hola, la bon temps voilà. Hey, ha, the good times pass. Pover, Piero, monsoir. Mon beau soleil, sang out Paul Minked up ahead. What a day, pards, what a day. A tremor moved the ground and the reed beds rippled. Around them suddenly boiled the clown cloudy landscapes. The powerful mirages of the free states, all in a condition of minor agitation, as if not fully in focus. Crazy tendrils erupted into a bewildering kaleidoscope each fragment a fresh version of its surroundings and of the people inhabiting them. A thousand images of themselves in a variety of roles and identities poured away down fresh cracks in the fabric of their histories. Sam Oakenhurst found this a depressing illusion. They refused to search for the centre and hold, it, hold to it against all attacks and temptations. There must be sacrifices, lines drawn, and faith. You're familiar with the Pilgrim's Progress, Mr. Oakenhurst, you being a preacher's son. Well, there's a book, eh? But if only life was so simple. We must press on, holding together through this valley of desolation to our just reward. We must know complete trust. And what a reward, my dears. 
orange and yellow pillars pissed like egg yolk into the sky and splashed upon a gory firmament. Here we are, seeing Paul minked, this is it. He paused before the yelling pillars and threw back his head as if to drink them up. His crude cartographic visor flickered and flashed and made new reflections. We are about to pass into the free states. This is the malleable world indeed. This or one like it must bend to our will. Do you not think? The rose was unimpressed. Not as malleable as some, she told Sam Oakenhurst. She moved with an extra grace as if until now her blood had hardly quickened. She had the alertness of an animal in its natural element. Sam Oakenhurst thought they were walking into the suburbs of hell, and he told her that, while he remained at her service, he was also entirely in her hands. This experience was too unfamiliar. He had thought the stories only legends. Here is what all matter should aspire to, Paul Mink continued. Here is true tolerance. Everything is free. Tolerance without mercy, murmured Sam Oakenhurst, willing to reveal this fear, if only to disguise the other more profound anxieties. We shall find further allies here, Paul Mink appeared to have forgotten his earlier pledge as he led them between the columns. I will guide you. But it was soon left for the rose to lead them, with miraculous confidence through the vivid shadows, through volatile matter and corrupted time. Perspective, gravity and the seasons were all unstable, and Sam Oakenhurst felt he must throw up as Paul minked with angry gestures of refusal had done after they walked the bridge of rubies for uncountable hours. Mr Minked, expecting to be the most experienced of them, clearly resented the Rose's easy pathfinding. Generally he managed to hide his feelings. It was as if, with the sureness of one who knew such waters well, she steered their boat through the wildest rapids. Agitated scratchings came from within Paul Minkt's mask and swaddlings. Occasionally the enmascarado uttered a little shrill, bubbling sound which added to Sam Oakenhurst's own fearful nausea. For a while, it seemed, they passed between fields of stars, crossing by silver spans of moonbeams. But the rose told them it was the abandoned forecourt of the divided Arabia, which at one time had been the largest shopping mall in the Western Hemisphere. What they, miss what they witnessed was what it had become. That stuff scares the devil out of me, Sam Oakenhurst admitted as they emerged from a forest of bright metallic greenery into a wide relief of desert, dominated by the brazen stability of a tiny sun. Now, my dears, this is more like Texas, said Paul Minkt.